I, I listened to the previous talks, very nice uh, algorithms, how to treat diabetes with sulfonylureas, SGLT2, GLP-1. But I'm going to go a little outside the box and see if we can you know, maneuver ketones and somehow get ketones to improve diabetes control. And I'll make a case for that. So the topic is causes endogenous ketosis versus therapeutic ketosis. First of all, my conflict of interest disclosures are up there. I am a speaker for AstraZeneca and I get uh, research support from the NIH in the US. What I'm going to try and do in the next 25, 27 minutes is review the physiology of ketone bodies, discuss the role of ketone bodies, and traditionally we have thought of them as an alternative fuel su substrate during fasting. But there is now a growing concept that ketones actually they're signaling molecules. The cell has got a receptor for beta-hydroxybutyrate and some even as to acetate. And they have multiple effects on tissue inflammation, oxidative stress, mitochondrial biogenesis and function. I will try and differentiate between endogenous ketones, ketosis, which the body makes, and exogenous, which you can give from outside. And lastly, of course, discuss the role of therapeutic ketosis in healthy adults not people with disease and also in those with chronic diseases. Now, when we think of ketones, we have all been taught DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. But could ketones actually play a role in human nutrition? I mean, nature did not just put ketones into the body and say, hey, you got nothing to do. Of course, when we think of nutrition, we all need the three classic macronutrients, carbohydrate, protein, and fat. And of course, our mitochondria convert this into carbon dioxide, water, and ATP, and that can provide energy for all bodily functions. Why would we need ketones? We've got carbohydrates, we've got proteins, we've got fats. Well, it is to provide energy when we don't eat. See, when you're eating, there's enough carbohydrate, protein, and fat. And of course, we have fat as an energy store, but the body has a reason for having ketones in the system. Now, let's just say a person fasts for 24 hours. So this is from uh, uh, George Cahill, New England Journal of Medicine, 50 years ago. So he's done some extensive studies. He's put catheters in the brain, in the liver, in the spleen, everywhere. Anyway, if an, a, a person who's fasting, say, let's just say that person fasts for 24 hours and about on an 1800 calorie diet. Where is the fuel going to come from? Muscle breaks down to provide glucose. It's about 75 grams. I mean, granted, we've got 20, 30 kilos of muscle, but we need to save it. And that is predominantly that glucose, about 180 grams, goes to the CNS, about 145 grams. And 35 grams, don't forget the red blood cell, the white blood cell. They cannot use fat, fatty acids. They don't have uh, white cells do have it, but they don't. Some of them don't have it. Red cell has no nucleus, no mitochondria. How can they use fatty acids and do the beta oxidation? They have to have glucose over there. Adipose tissue, of course, provides nutrients. Bro broken down FFAs goes to the heart, the kidney, and the muscle. But when you fast for more than 24 hours, you can't be breaking down your muscle. Muscle has to be spared. And the ketones are the ones which provide fuel for the high fuel consuming organs, the heart, the uh, kidneys, uh, the, uh, the brain and all of it. And just out of curiosity, the longest a human being has been fasted under supervised conditions, 382 days. This was published of course in 1973. And this was Angus Barbieri in London, it was done. He was 456 pounds. And at the end he was 180 pounds and he lost 276 pounds in 382 days. You can go and read it. Of course, he had to drink water, minerals. They gave him vitamins. And apparently, he was so constipated, he used to pass a stool once in three weeks. But he used to pass a stool. Anyway, we all know there are three ketone bodies. Acetoacetate is the cardinal ketone body, which we recognize. And of course, it can be converted, de dehydrogenated, to uh, oxidize, sorry, to beta hydroxy, uh, de, sorry, reduced to beta hydroxybutyrate and decarboxylated to acetone. How are ketones made? Let's just take a quick step into the liver hepatocyte because ketones are only made in the liver. 
not anywhere else, at least in adult uh, uh, metabolism. So we all know the famous Krebs cycle for which Hans Krebs actually got the Nobel Prize nearly 80 years ago. Acetyl-CoA comes from glucose or pyruvate. It comes from free fatty acids after beta oxidation. And of course, it condenses with oxaloacetate through citrate synthase, it forms citrate. And of course, citrate will become cisaconitate and go on to form oxaloacetate. But when you're fasting, there is an increased need for gluconeogenesis to supply the brain, the red cells, the WBCs, as I told you. Where's that glucose going to come from? Well, it comes from oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate is sent back, as you all know, through the PEPCK phosphoenol pyruvate pathway to form new glucose over there. And that, what then happens to acetyl-CoA? Acetyl-CoA without oxaloacetate cannot go into the Krebs cycle. It has to find something to do. And of course, when glucose is low and insulin is low, there is a lot of free fatty acids. And there's a whole bunch of beta oxidation acetyl-CoA that in the setting of low insulin is diverted to form acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate. So in short, ketones actually are fat-derived molecules that serve as an energy source during starvation, fasting, and also during prolonged exercise. In fact, initially it was thought that ketones are waste products of, till 100 years ago, waste products of fat metabolism. No. In the fed state, as we said, we are, you're eating, there's lots of carbohydrate. Ketone levels are undetectable to less than one millimolar. Under conditions of fasting, as you know, there's less carbohydrate coming in. You can make glucose from your glycogen, but muscle is only about 300 grams. Liver is 100 grams. It will barely take you to about a day. And after that, you have to go to fat, which of course is mobilized from fat tissue. And some of this Conver is de derived, is converted to ketone bodies in the mitochondria of the hepatocyte. After an overnight fast, different people, depending on how much you ate, how much fat, how much carbohydrate you ate, circulating ketone levels are about 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 millimolar. And of course, acetoacetate and beta hydroxybutyrate, they go to all the big tissues, brain, heart, skeletal muscle, and everything. Now I have to point out that when there is low-grade hyperketonemia, as I'm talking about fats, even if you fast for about five, six days, it can go to about three to five millimolar. I'm not talking about DKA. The H ion, which is produced with the ketones, because the body produces beta-hydroxybutyric acid and acetoacetic acid, and immediately dissociates into the acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate, but you have to buffer the H ion. And if you're making it slowly, bicarbonate is enough to by buffer it. That's the biggest buffer we have. and But it has to be regenerated in the kidney. And in conditions of accelerated ketogenesis, like in DKA and other conditions, there the buffering capacity through the bicarb is exceeded. And of course, H ion will accumulate and you get ketoacidosis. I'm talking about ketosis and ketogenesis and I'm not talking about the acid ion, uh, uh, the H ion, which is buffered. Remember, I think I like to remind people, we come into this world in a ketotic state. Human beings with such a big brain, which uh, differentiates us from others, we could not have evolved without ketones. Remember, the fetus, I cannot do fat metabolism. The ketone, uh, the fetus is sitting in the amniotic fluid. There's no, not much oxygen or anything. Everything is diffusing through. It lives in a ketotic state. And again, I go back to George Cahill. Beautiful article. And this is what he showed. On the x-axis is hours or days time. On the y-axis, it's beta hydroxybutyrate and millimolar. So look at a newborn infant. It is born with about 0.5 millimolar. And when the infant is fasting for about two hours, it is one millimolar, three hours, Two millimolar. That is why infants need to feed initially every two to three hours because they get ketotic. 
of course, the infant, of course, will it, it takes about four hours to reach one millimolar uh, over there. And remember, in the first few days of life, mother's milk contains very little lactose. There's nothing. It's mostly immunoglobulin. It takes a day or two for the feet, uh, the infant to uh, ramp up the fatty acid oxidation metabolism. And that's why in the first week of life, all infants will lose and they'll burn up the fat which they come into this world with. And of course, the same amount of ketones in adults, you have to fast for about 24 hours or more. Men, women became ketotic a little bit more than men. We have to, the infant comes in ketotic. We have to fast for about 24 hours over there. Are ketones good? And this was this great article uh, which was published by George Cahill. He said, the principal ketone in starving man displaces glucose as the predominant fluid. And of course, as I said, it spares uh, the need for glucose synthesis and you spare muscle. Otherwise, you know, you will go do this thing. And that's why we can survive so long for months with starvation. As, as I showed you over there, without this, Homo sapiens could not have evolved with such a large brain. And in fact, he said, beta hydroxybutyrate is not just a fuel, but a super fuel producing ATP much more efficiently than glucose or fatty acid. And based on this, as you know, in 2016, our group published this uh, uh, review article in Diabetes Care. We said, can a shift in fuel energetics explain the beneficial cardiorenal outcomes in the Emperor outcome trial? A unifying hypothesis. We said that these benefits are because the heart and the kidney shifts from glucose and fat, which is inefficient in the setting of type 2 diabetes in the diabetic heart and kidney, and even I would submit in the non-diabetic heart and kidney, towards a super efficient fuel like ketone bodies, which improve myocardial work and efficiency and contribute at least in part to their benefits. We were the first to say myocardial and renal fuel metabolism. Eli Ferranini published in the same journal, in the same, uh, 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 in the same issue, he said the thrifty substrate for the heart, we said it is both heart and the kidney. And we got a lot of pushback, but subsequent studies, all the studies we are seeing now, emperor, DAPA heart, DAPA kidney. In fact, then I predicted, I said, even in HEFPEF, it would have. I did not really know that in non-diabetics, but it has been proven. And of course, evidence now suggests that beta hydroxybutyrate is much more than an efficient fuel source. It also suppresses oxidative stress. It's got anti-inflammatory effects. It benefits mitochondria a lot. Mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. And just uh, late last year, we wrote another paper in diabetes, obesity, and metabolism, publishing a novel hypothesis. We updated it and we said low-grade ketonemia is what we think contributes at least partly to the cardiorenal benefits of SGLT2. I won't bore you, bore you with the details of this figure. If you're interested, you can go and read the article. Bottom line is SGLT2 inhibitors block the SGLT2 transporters, and that through various mechanisms leads to low-grade ketone, hyperketonemia. I'm talking about doubling of fasting ketones. 0.2 to 0.4, even in non-diabetic people, it goes from about 0.15 to 0.30. Of course, it's a good fuel, but let's not forget its anti-inflammatory effects, antioxidative stress. It ameliorates hypoxia, and uh, Dr. Dandona is on this. He has published about hepsi hepsidin and all that in this erythropoietin and HIF1 factors, mTOR C1, uh, mitochondrial function through PGC1 alpha, and of course, has got anti sympathetic effects uh, as well through GPR41. All that improves heart and kidney, and we get less heart and kidney failure. In addition, of course, I have, we have to uh, acknowledge there are ketone independent mechanisms hemodynamic, vascular, and metabolic. How can we take advantage of all the multiple benefits of ketones? Can we do therapeutic ketosis? And I want to say therapeutic ketosis is defined as 0.5 to 2 millimolar per liter. And this concept was put forward by Daniel Kelly and others about three years ago. And he talked about it in the setting of heart failure. So how can we get ketones? Well, let's look at this nice figure, which was published in a review article last year. Of course, we can all go on a ketogenic diet and I'll go into details of it. That is endogenous ketosis. We can take medium chain triglycerides 
and that is coconut oil. And I will go into this. We can take beta hydroxybutyrate per se as a salt. And of course, we can take oral ketone esters. So the ketogenic diet, I think you all know about it. It's got advantages is it decreases body weight, HDL cholesterol. And of course, the ketone diet, diet is low carbs. What is a low carb? According to international guidelines and definitions, it's less than 135 grams per day. That is what the maximum the liver can put in. And of course, we all need at least 200 to 250 grams of carbohydrate per day. So once you fall below 100 and below 50 for sure on this diet, and it has been used since the 1920s, Disadvantage, of course, it's not easy to adhere to. You may risk your body glycogen stores. There's a risk of dyslipidemia. Cost is low. And of course, ketones re remain elevated the whole day. Let's talk about medium chain triglycerides. Now, as you know, compared to long chain triglycerides. So what do I mean by medium chain triglycerides, which is present in coconut oil? It's Carbon-6, carbon-8, caprylic acid is the main one, C10. That's a rich source. Remember, they grow straight to the liver. They are not handled like others. And they, there is evidence even in humans that they are not stored as triglycerides. They are oxidized, beta-oxidized, and they are used for uh, ketose uh, production. And I've done the studies on myself. You have to consume uh, caprylic acid per se. It's available and keto, coconut oil is difficult. You can't drink too much of coconut oil. You'll get diarrhea and all that. But my ketones go from about 0 0.2 to 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 as well. It preserves glycogen in the muscle uh, over there. Of course, you may get, and if you take coconut oil, it's dyslipidemia. Of course, you some people can get GI side effects. It's expensive. It works out to about... Uh, $10 a day for the pure caprylic acid, and you get ketones for about three hours. Benefits have been seen in published studies, some for weight loss, diabetes, epilepsy, and Alzheimer's disease. I know Dr. Itma Raz was talking about using sildenafil, Viagra, for improving brain, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, brain function. What about beta hydroxybutyrate salt? Why can't we take it? The problem is that it's got a high sodium load and it's not easy to take it. You know, people have tried it in a drink with, with injection and all that. Of course, there are there's no risk of acidosis, but you get a huge sodium load over there. And IV infusion has got multiple hemodynamic benefits in HEFREF. This study was published four years ago. It improves one infusion for three hours, increases in HEFREF patients, increasing cardiac output by two liters per minute and other benefits as well. Cost is low. You get about three hours of it. What about a ketone ester? The advantage is it's a drink and it preserves glycogen. And of course, it's got multiple benefits. Your ketones, when I took it, my ketones go up to two millimolar. You have to take it in the fasting state. It lasts for about three to four hours. It has been used by Tour de France cyclists. It's allowed by the World Doping Agency. Unfortunately, it's very expensive. It's about $30 a day. I do the math on that. That's about uh, uh, what 2,400 uh, rupees per day. But it is allowed by the World Doping Agency. And in 2016, the British Olympic team suddenly won five gold medals. And later it was revealed that they all took this ketone drink. The patent for it is held by Kieran Clark at the University of Oxford and the United States Department of Defense. Anyway, it's got beneficial effects on HEFREF. But all of this, taking the coconut oil, taking the beta hydroxybutyrate salt, ketone ester, that is all exogenous ketones. You give it into the body and it is made to, to ketones. I would argue this is endogenous, but it's half-half. And of course, ketogenic diet is endogenous. And of course, SGLT2 inhibitor is also endogenous ketosis. It's about twice baseline fasting. In the uh, once you eat a meal, the uh, uh, because insulin goes up, it suppresses ketogenesis. Remember, keto uh, insulin cannot suppress uh, uh, these the ketogenesis from uh, uh, medium chain trigly triglycerides for various reasons. But even non-diabetics get a doubling of serum ketones, and I postulate that this is what is giving the benefits. And of course, you've seen all the studies, all the DAPA, HF, Empress studies over there. 
Also, as you know, it's the only class of drugs approved to decrease hospitalization for heart failure, CV death, progression to kidney disease and all that. Can oral ketone administration per se have CV benefits? Because if that's how the SGLT2 inhibitors work, well, if you give ketones in that dose, should it help? Well, it does. And this is a nice article looking at myocardial ketone body. They did some very sophisticated studies and they looked at it and they found, yes, acute nutritional ketosis enhances beta-hydroxybutyric uh, extraction in patients with HEFREF compared to control. And this enhancement correlates with degree of cardiac dysfunction and remodeling. Now, I agree there are many studies. Some say yes, some say no, maybe, and some say yes. Approximately 40% of the studies say yes, and about 60%, 30% say maybe, 30% are yes. But this is a nice study. I liked it. Acute echo effects of exogenous ketones in healthy people. Remember, I told you, told that France cyclists are using it. Swimmers are using it. Then what is ketones doing to them? They don't have a disease. And this was a nice study. I won't go into the details of it. You can look at it in the German Journal of the American Society of Echocardiography. Multiple beneficial effects on myocardial function and other hemodynamic parameters in healthy adults, similar to that seen in heart failure patients. Ketones also have uh, benefits in other chronic diseases. As I told you, it's been used to treat pediatric epilepsy. This is a, a, a JAMA from 1927, 96 years ago. See what they said. Prolonged fasting has got effects to suppress epilepsy. And that was shown in 1921. It ameliorates the symptoms of epilepsy. And then this guy said, one of the metabolic peculiarities is that you accumulate acetoacetic acid and beta-hydroxybutyric acid and acetone. And he also said, Similar ketosis occurs in diabetes when oxidation of sugar is sufficiently depressed and may be provoked in non-diabetics by, by diet. So he said, yeah, it happens in diabetes. Remember, insulin was just introduced and these guys are already making these profound uh, observations. It's been studied a lot. There's nice articles. Uh, what? How does it do it? I won't go into the details. It affects the mitochondria, the mitochondrial mTOR pathways, synaptic transmit, uh, recycling, ion channels, metabolism, immune function, epigenetics, all of it. If you look at clinicaltrials.gov, ketones and cancer, let alone for everything else, 86 studies are going on. The big thing is, can ketones slow down aging? Can we slow the biologic clock? I think there was a uh, the, yeah, there are some people uh, who talk a lot about slowing the biological clock. And this is a nice article which looks at beta-hydroxybutyrate and its effects on age-related pathology. As you all know, we cannot stop the biologic clock. We go older and of course we get all the age-related diseases, cancers, dementia, cardiovascular disease. Remember, the biggest risk factor for a heart attack or stroke in any calculator is age, the older you are. Independent of, of course, your LDL, blood pressure, A1C matter. If beta-hydroxybutyrate can slow the biologic clock, can we improve metabolism, age slower? We can't stop aging and re neural regeneration. And studies have shown, small studies, this is medium chain triglycerides in patients with Alzheimer's, randomized, double-blind, placebo control and with an open label extension. And they showed that up to nine months, there are long, there are uh, stabilization or improvement in cognition through various, uh, the mini mental score, the conigram scores and all that. Small studies, early days. But guess what? The NIH, the National Institute of Aging has become involved. There is a study just started. It's on clinicaltrials.gov. They want to see if ketone ester can improve biomarkers of brain metabolism and cognitive performance in cognitively intact because we all have age-related cognitive decline. Now, oh, what's his name? What's that name? I forget this name. Anybody above 55 years old and they're going to do the study. I think we need to prove it once and for all. What about ketones and diabetes? What was the treatment? Let's look back to what was the treatment of diabetes before oral agents and insulin. I'll be finishing in another two, three minutes just for time. This is Elliot Johnson, 
This is what he wrote in 1916, 1,000 cases. It's fascinating if you go and look at his original article. He published it. He said, when I'm asked to see a new, a new case of diabetes, I beg the physician, don't change the diet or just stop the, all the fat until he sees me. And then he omits the fat. After two days, the protein is gone. Carbohydrate is halved. And then the patient is on 10 grams of fat. And then this is a keto diet. Six years later, we got insulin. And then, of course, 90 years later, 10 years ago, we got the SGLT2 inhibitors and the editorial in Lancet was turning symptoms into therapy. And I submit, SGLT2 inhibitors have shown robust cardiorenal benefits, which are at least partly due to changes in fuel energetics through key, which ketones, which also have other pleiotropic benefits. I showed you over there. Studies are going on to see if you can give small doses of ketones, and that at least will support the hypothesis. Well, exogenous therapeutic ketosis also have similar benefits. I don't know. We have to find out. So in summary, I think ketones are more than an efficient fuel source. They are signaling molecules with multiple benefits. I've shown you some of them. There are several ways I've shown you to achieve therapeutic ketosis, endogenous, exogenous. Ongoing studies will clarify the potential cardiac, renal, neurologic, and other benefits of ketones in healthy people and those with heart failure and other chronic ailments. Remember, healthy people also, sorry. And I think in the interest of time, I'll stop over here. Thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to questions. I'll stop sharing.